Well, I'd like again to welcome you to our exploration of the Gospel of John. And indeed, every time we enter the Word of God, we always want to do that with prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your Word, and we solicit the presence of your Holy Spirit to open this Word to our hearts and lives, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and King, and that we might be more effective stewards of the opportunities that you'll put across our path in the days ahead, as we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ indeed. Amen. Well, the Gospel of John, this is a uh, favorite of many. You know, everybody has their favorites. Uh, the Gospel of John is kind of a strange one. Many people got introduced to the Bible by a little pamphlet version of the Gospel of John. It's, it's used as an introductory thing for beginners. And it lends itself to that, on the one hand. On the other hand, it also will challenge the most sophisticated theologians. As, they, as one uh, a wag quipped, he said, it's shallow enough for a, a child to wade in, but it's deep enough to bathe an elephant in. In other words, it'll go as deep as you can. You can, you can have a lifetime study and still make new discoveries as you go through. And you're going to probably see some this evening that you may catch you by surprise. And so we're in the third session, and uh, we are in John chapter 2. Those of you that were this first few sessions thought we'd never make it through the chapter, but we did. Okay, so we are in chapter 2. And uh, uh, one of the, just a few review items. One of the things John does in chapter 20, near the end of his gospel, he, he gives us the reason he's writing this. He's not trying to get a journalistic award or something. No, he's written this with a specific agenda. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And that's his objective. John's objective is that you might have life through his name. And we talked about Logos last time and so forth. Uh, Jesus is the Christ. The, the International Standard Version Bible, which is just coming out, uh, doesn't have the word Christ in the New Testament. It uses the word Messiah. Same word, but it carries, I think, a little more roots, if you will, uh, for us. Last time we summarized a few things, and I won't recap all that except to alert you the, the need to du double back on these. Metaphors... Uh, can often be masquerades to hide the fact that there are underlying mysteries that we have yet to resolve. And so that's a key thing for us. And we studied Logos last time. That's not just word in a simplistic sense. It's a, a concept that's being um, uh, opened and, and manifested. And it's a title of Christ that he puts above his name, which is a staggering uh, uh, insight. We talked about light. One of the fundamental mysteries to this day in physics, and we talked a little bit about that. Not to; these are terms that we in, in in churchianity we tend to throw these words around loosely, and I hope we outgrow that in terms of recognizing these metaphors have a depth that we have yet to probe in terms of the word as a title of Christ. John uses that a lot in his epistles as well as as well as here, but also the idea he's the light of the world. What does that really mean? especially when you realize there's aspects of light we still don't understand to this day. Well, there's going to be a third one, and that is charis, or grace. And that's the most amazing of all. And the, the, the song was very well named. And grace, the grace, the more you understand it, the more amazing it is. But something else from last time, we also had a, a little exploration of the tabernacle, how everything in the tabernacle points to Jesus Christ, this portable uh, uh, a worship center that moved with them for the 38 years in the wilderness. And uh, so, and roughly 75 by 150 feet, white linen in the circle, you enter the door, you came to the altar of sacrifice, and then the laver, to enter then into the the temple proper, the tabernacle proper, a, a uh, portable building, really, designed for this purpose. And uh, all the elements in it, each one, are identified with Jesus Christ, specifically. Not just uh, rhetorically, he himself identifies with them. And uh, there's a holy place and the holy of holies. And the holy of holies is defined by the presence of the mercy seat, not the Ark of the Covenant, 
There's a subtlety there that you want to chase down. But there's a door, and then there's the seven-branched candlestick that we were, a lampstand is more precise, uh, that they call the menorah. And then we have the table of showbread, and then the golden altar, this little small thing that is held the, uh, the, incense, the incense altar, before going through the final veil into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest, only once a year after great preparation, was allowed to enter with the Ark of the Covenant and, of course, the mercy seat itself. And what's interesting about all of this, of course, last time we closed on the verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. And Jesus made a claim. through Before the Gospel of John is finished, he's going to claim to be that door. Anyone that enters some other way is a three for a robber. He says, I am the light of the world. We have the the one, he's the primary branch, and the six for man gives you the seven, the men are on. There's a whole study behind that. And I am the bread of life. He will make that statement. And he makes intercession for us. And, of course, he's our sin bearer, and, of course, he's our propitiation. So he, he's specifically identified with each one of these before this gospel is finished. And so the more you study the gospel of John, the more you're going to find evidences of design, not just of John, but the whole Bible. And that's something you need to find for you. Don't accept it because I say so. I hope you don't do any of that. I mention it so that you'll be alert to it, but you need to discover those things for yourself. Our goal is not to teach you a specific theology. Our goal is to equip you to come to your own uh, uh, perceptions of these things, to be what's called a self-feeder. That's our goal. That's part of what we're all about. Anyway, chapter 1, of course, introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God, an offering for sin. We talked about that. And we'll be talking much more about that. Chapter 2 explores two events, and these two events are very strange. One is the changing of the water to wine. We all know the little story. We're going to go into it. But I suggest to you that I have yet to find any commentators that really explore why all of that. There's some issues there that are going to come out of that. And also in this chapter, he will leave Cana, go to Capernaum for a few days, and then go to Jerusalem and cleanse the temple, cast the money changers out. So these two make uh, up chapter 2. And uh, the question I'm going to ask you at the end is, are these two things connected? Is there a connection with the water and the wine in Cana and his cleansing the temple of the money changers? Have they got anything to do with one another? You wouldn't think so. Let's see what happens as we go forward. So we're in John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And the third day... There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So this is a passage that extols marriage. Many people use it as an example that God blesses marriage. It doesn't need just this one. That's all through the scripture, but it certainly isn't keeping with that. But there is a str- the, the, it's the, it's also what is a little strange to many is this apparently is his first miracle. Why is that significant? Well, for one reason, you can save a lot of trouble not wasting time on these legends of childhood miracles by Christ. Because they're phony, they're nonsense. How do I know? It says so. This is his first miracle. So all these stories you hear are nonsense uh, in terms of childhood miracles and so forth. Um, But there's something else here. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana. What does that mean? The third day. Now it turns out there's a Jewish reason for that, and there may be a more mystical reason for that. And uh, if we study the book of Genesis, we'll discover something that the third day has a uniqueness to it. God created the earth, uh, the, the world, the universe, in how many days? Can't hear you. Six days. Good. Okay. So far. Okay. All the way through there, six times he says, and it was good. He did this, that, and the other thing, and it was good. Except on Monday. The first day, fine. The second day, there's no, it was good. When you get to Tuesday, the third day, he blesses it twice. There are six, and it was goods, but they're not uniformly distributed because Monday doesn't have a blessing, as the Jewish would say. But Tuesday is known among... Uh, among the Jews, the rabbis, as the day of double blessing. And that's why Jewish marriages are usually on Tuesdays, because it's the day of double blessing. 
this may be part of that, you see. Day one, we had darkness, let there be light, and it was good. Day two, the water separated, but there was no it was good statement. The, th the earth emerges from its watery grave, and that's a whole other study. The third day is the day of double blessing, and it was good, but twice he says that. So that's why they call it the day of double blessing. Now, let the waters be and the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let dry land appear, and it was so, and, and, and he called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. And, got, and let the earth uh, bring forth grass and herb bearing shield, uh, seed, and uh, fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself, and the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself, after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now the point here, and then the evening and the morning were the third day. So we're together so far. Third day, two blessings. One is in verse uh, 10, and the other one in, in the verse 12. And so that's why it's called the day of double blessing. That may be why we have the event in Cana occur on the third day. Okay. I'm going to show you some other reasons, maybe, that you can't find any commentary, so be on your guard. The path I'm leading on you may be uh, fraught with some error here. Well, we're down to verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now, it's, um, it's interesting that Mary is never mentioned by, by name in this gospel. There may be some reasons for that. You may recall that John was given the stewardship over Mary at the cross. And so uh, maybe calling her Mary was uncomfortable for him. I don't know, or mother or whatever. But, um, okay, so, when he says, woman, what have I to do with thee, that is not a put-down. It sounds like that in the English. Woman, what do I, you? It, it, it's, it seems like a, a, a denigrating remark. It's not. It's gunai in the Greek. It means a wife of betrothed. It's actually an expression of respect and affection. So it, don't jump to conclusions. It's not one of abuse. Some people mis, mis, misunderstand that. Okay. Uh, he, the other word uh, could have been mater, which was uh, uh, if, if he wanted to emphasize the authority thing for some reason. Uh, remember, seed of the woman was his first title in the in the Torah, in in the, in the uh, uh, Genesis three fifteen. So, the seed of the woman is a major major title of our kinsman redeemer. But in any case, uh, he says, "Mine hour is not yet come." This phrase that you're going to find occurs eight times in this gospel. And uh, the f in the first three, the emphasis is on the hour not having come yet. And uh, there is a specific time when his hour has come. And of course, you're going to discover some surprising things that over half of the gospel of John occurs in the last week of the ministry. One third of the verses in the gospel of John deal with the last 24 hours or I should say, with a 24-hour period. So he's going to telescope that as we go. So the hour is coming, obviously. And uh, there's, it's interesting, Joseph, the father, the, uh, the legal father of Jesus, is not disappears from the record. Most commentators presume, we don't know, that he, had, he passed away. And uh, there are six disciples present. Those are the six that we encountered in the previous chapter. Okay, uh, They were two brothers... Uh, Peter and Andrew, and two brothers, John, uh, uh, John and James. All four of them were in the fishing business, maybe in together in partners for all we know. And then, of course, Philip and Nathaniel. Nathaniel's hometown was Cana, by the way, for what it's worth. Now, Jesus had two half-brothers that are not in the picture yet because they don't become believers. He had four half-brothers, but two of them become believers after the resurrection. They're not numbered with apostles. Okay, both Jude and James are their names. And when we say James, the word is actually Yaakov or Jacob, but that's okay. Let's not get too confused here. Continuing with verse 5 and 6. His mother said unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Now a firkin is a goat skin measurement of about six to eight gallons. 
two or three firkins would equal about 12 to 24 gallons of wine each, and there were six, t- six of these pots. So that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of wine that we're going to end up with, okay? We're going to come back to the water. It's amazing to me how commentators, and I've been through 50 or 60 of them, don't comment on the water that was used. We're going to come back to this as we go. Anyway, what Jesus said, and fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. Now, the word governor of the feast, that's actually a servant, of a, a senior servant kind of guy. He's the chief of the banquet hall on three couches is what the word actually means. And uh, he's a governor of the feast. Now, something, a footnote here, by the way. We're talking about wine, right? One of the things you all should do is learn, if you don't know it already, the agricultural calendar of Israel. To understand that, to understand both the Old and the New Testament. Okay? Grapes are harvested in the fall. That's just a fact. Fact of history. They're harvested in the fall. There was no refrigeration there in those days. So there's no way you're going to end up with grape juice in the spring. Passover is in the spring. We celebrate communion as an echo of Passover, which means it's in the spring. In their day, they couldn't have grape juice if they wanted it, because wine has a natural way of preserving itself. It ferments into wine, or vinegar, whatever you're after. So uh, um, I mention that because I'm not disparaging communions in today's world we often have communion with grape juice for lots of good reasons not the least of which is to, in deference to people who do, don't want to touch wine fine but I'm tired of trying to read th- th- theological writings saying they really had grape juice back then no that doesn't make sense if you know anything about the agricultural calendar of Israel for what it's worth anyway when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called to the bridegroom. Amos 3, 7, the Lord will do nothing but that which he reveals to his servants. I think that's interesting. He said to them, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. <laughs> A very interesting comment by the, by the experienced a purveyor here. Normally, people put the good wine first and the second stuff later. He says, you saved the best wine to last. That, if nothing else, tells me it was good wine. Okay. And uh, so, he tasted the water wine, and it was excellent wine, obviously. Good wine until now. The best to last, no surprise. And then John gives us a summary here. says that this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee which manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So it's interesting, one of the byproducts, this didn't impress anybody at the, fe- at the feast, but his disciples, the servants that, and the disciples knew what was going on, and they were obviously impressed, and uh, they believed on him. So that's, that's the beginning, the beginning of miracles. And so uh, now... There's also some hint here several times. We saw it in verse 14, and there's also here. When it, says manis- when it speaks of manifesting forth his glory, that could be a generic phrase. It also might be a specific allusion to the transfiguration. And we talked about that last time. I just mentioned it in passing. He manifested forth his glory. Well, what I'd like to do here is stop a little bit and take a little closer look. And uh, remember that the Old Testament period ends with John the Baptist. The law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. One of the things that we see here, that it, one of the teachings that comes out of the, uh, that you'll see in some of the commentating literature, is that uh, this can speak to the regeneration of the believer. That's anticipating chapter 3, the one that's coming. There were six water pots, six is the number of man. They were empty, presumably, in stone. Uh, they were from, from purifying religion is empty. In other words, that's, that, that's, that's the premise here. The, from the command of Christ, they filled it with good wine and the new beginning of miracles. And so we have it manifested his glory. And the fruit here is that many believed on him. So some people spiritualize 
the application of this so far along that flavor. Are you with me so far? I'm not disparaging, and I want to go one step further if we can. Okay. Also here, we can talk about, obviously, Kana is a springboard to talk about the marriage. And God uses the marriage to communicate his most intimate truths. We have a whole study on that. We have materials on that. And uh, you, we have all probably studied marriage in terms of its biological basis, procreation and so forth, its psychological basis, two partners sharing life, the ups and downs of life's journey. That's the sociological basis is the molecule of our community and so forth. And uh, most of us probably haven't studied marriage in its spiritual or supernatural basis. And that's what in, that will take you to Ephesians 5. And is a very, very fruitful study to tackle that. I'm not going to derail the whole study here. I want to just mention it in passing. And uh, it's interesting, when you go through Ephesians 5, you'll discover there are two rules, one for each person. The, to the woman, let the man be in charge. And to the man, love the woman supremely. And uh, it's amazing, just two rules. It's amazing, can't we... We, we each can't uh, follow even just having one rule, but uh, we'll move on here. Let's continue. The mother said to the servants, whatsoever he saith, do it. And there were set there six water parts of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. That's a phrase that even if you're somewhat expert in the Old Testament, you may not realize what that's talking about. And so I want to peel that back just to cover that ground here. What water was used? Now, the water was almost empty because they added water to make it wine, but they weren't totally empty because it was the pots for purifying of the Jews. How did they do that? To get into that whole subject, um, the water of purification, I want to give you a little background insert in your notes here about the ashes of the red heifer. There is a topic that occupies the full chapter 19 of the book of Numbers called the Ashes of the Red Heifer. What is bizarre about this, if you study the commentators of the Old Testament, most of them are incorrect, is how they deal with this. Because it is not an offering and it is not a sacrifice. It's usually lumped with those. It's not. That's neither. It's a procedure that's totally weird, different, distinct, what have you. So be, be guard, on your guard here as we get into this. It's very strange and widely misunderstood. Understand up front, it is not a sacrifice nor an offering. If you define either one of these, it eludes both of those definitions. The book of Leviticus, the whole Torah, is full of sacrifices and offerings of all different kinds under different circumstances. This is not one of them. And so, it's interesting that the red ashes of the red heifer are in the news a lot because there are rabbinical efforts being put to get a red heifer to comply with this in preparation or for rebuilding the temple. Which is also, by the way, footnote, silly, because the Mishnah, the Tesefta, the Tanakh, you don't need the red heifer to build the new temple. It, it'd be nice, but it's not. Turns out there's procedures around that, by the way. But let's, that's neither here nor here. The red heifer. I want us to look at Numbers 19. Starting verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring thee a red heifer. That's a female. That's the only place you got a female in the procedures, by the way. A red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. So it's got to be perfect, and it's got to be never been yoked. And ye shall give her unto Eliezer the priest, he's in effect the acting high priest sort of here, uh, that he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. So they're doing this outside the camp of Israel, but in the presence of the high priest. Without the camp, that's important. Eliezer the priest shall take of her blood with his finger, and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. So his gesture here is to tie this to the temple or to the tabernacle. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin, her flesh, her blood, with her dung shall he burn. That's the whole thing. Not a sacrifice. This isn't an offering. 
They're burning the whole thing. And the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet. Apparently anything scarlet, something red, okay? And cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. So after all this, they burn the whole package and, and, the, what'll be, and deal with the ashes that are left. Then the priest shall wash his clothes and shall bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards he shall come into the camp, and the priest shall be unclean until even. He that burneth her shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in water and shall be unclean until even. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. Not an atonement, but some kind of ritual cleansing. Okay? And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until even, and it shall be unto the children of Israel and unto the stranger that sojourneth among them for a statute forever. It's a purification for sin. Okay. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with it on the third day. Oh, there it is again. And on the seventh day shall he be clean. But if he purify not himself the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. So if somehow a Jew, an observant Jew, stumbles, touches something dead, he's now ceremonially unclean. He's got to go through this procedure. The procedure takes a whole seven days. But there's an emphasis on the third day of the seventh. It somehow is significant. You with me so far? Okay. The third day again. Whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself, get this, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. What's that got to do with anything? How is his conduct somehow defiling the tabernacle of the Lord? That's a linkage. There's two linkages here that are puzzling. One is the third day issue. The other one is, how is this tied to the tabernacle or later on the temple? And that soul shall be cut off from Israel because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean and his uncleanness is yet upon him. This is the law. When a man dieth in a tent, all that come into the tent and all that is in the tent shall be unclean for seven days. And every open vessel which hath no covering bound upon it is unclean. And whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer a purification for sin, and running water shall be put there unto, uh, in a, thereto in a vessel. And a clean person shall take the hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon all the vessels and upon the persons that were there and upon him that touches a bone or slain or one dead or a grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day, there it is again, and on the seventh day, and on the seventh day shall he purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be clean at even. And so, but the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he hath defiled, what? The sanctuary of the Lord. Again, the linkage, not himself that defiled, he's defiled the temple. Do you get that linkage? The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him, he is unclean, because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord by not conforming to this. So that puzzles me. And it shall be a perpetual statute unto them that he that sprinkleth the water of the separation shall wash his clothes, and he that touches the water of separation shall be unclean till even. And whosoever that the unclean person touches shall be unclean, the soul that touches it shall be unclean until even. Whew. Okay, the ashes of the red heifer. A red cow, free of any defects, never been yoked. It was slain outside the camp in the presence of the high priest. Then he dipped his fingers in the blood and sprinkled it seven times in the direction of the sanctuary. Tabernacle in the old days, temple, you know, after uh, when there was a temple. And then the carcass was burned in his presence, the hide, the flesh, the blood, and also added cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet to the pyre. And uh, another man, ceremonially clean, gathered up the ashes, stored in a clean place outside the camp to be used in preparing the water purification. Now get the picture here. As the years go by and they grow into a nation, there were people that needed ritual cleansing 
that were a long way from Jerusalem. So what they did with the ash of red heifer, they would make quantities by just taking the ashes and adding water to it. They would make the water of purification. They had that, access to that, across the country. They had some in Cana. If somebody there needed purification, that's where they went to go through the procedure with the water of purification. They didn't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. That wouldn't work. That wouldn't be practical. Follow me? So that was part of the procedure. That, and it was that water that was set aside for that purpose that they were using in the, in the, uh, the wedding to turn into wine. You with me so far? Okay. All involved washing themselves, the clothes, and remain ceremony clean until sunset. And uh, the ashes were dissolved in fresh water, which were sprinkled on those who were contaminated by contact or proximity to a dead body. The one so contaminated remained unclean for seven days. He was sprinkled on the third and seventh day and was clean after the sunset on the seventh day. And uh, all who touched the water or the unclean person were unclean till sunset. Anyone neglected to observe the law was deprived of religious privileges, for he defiled the sanctuary of Yodhe And so, this is not a sacrifice. It's not an offering. It, and it's very problematic. If you try to study, the more you know about Leviticus, the less this fits. Why the emphasis on the third day? In this in number six, in Numbers uh, 19, wh 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 why... Wh how does that fit to anything? How is this connected to defiling the sanctuary? Those are two issues that puzzle me. Why the third day? What's that got to do with anything there? Secondly, what, uh, uh, why, how does this connect to the temple? It's going to connect to the temple before chapter 2 is over, but that's when he go, Jesus goes to Jerusalem. That's why I, I have a feeling there is a connection here that everybody's missed. Hebrews 9 says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, that's, he's making an allusion here in, in Hebrews 9, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So is Christ in some sense a fulfillment of this that we've overlooked? He's, over, he's a is a fulfillment of so many things, but this may be one that's been overlooked. Let's get to John verse 12. After Cana now, after this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. So Capernaum, of course, is somewhat of a capital. It's Kafar, now it's the village of Nahum. Not necessarily the name of the Bible, that's a common name, but anyway, Capernaum, the village of Nahum, is a fenced town as opposed to an unfenced village. It's on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's, a, it's a, obviously one you will visit when you go there. Uh, it is located on a major trade route from Damascus to the interior of, uh, uh, and the interior of Asia to the Mediterranean Sea. It probably served as the Jewish capital. Tiberius was the Roman capital, but there's no record of any of them going to Tiberius. Tiberius was a, a Roman city, but in further around, around to the north is Capernaum, and that was apparently the, the Jewish equivalent, if you will. Well, now we get into, in the gospel, going, we're going through John chapter 2, the next major event is the cleansing of the temple, and from verses 13 to the end of the chapter. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, by the way, in Deuteronomy 16, 16, it, tell, it says that every able-bodied male Jew, it was compulsory to go to Jerusalem. And uh, it was not optional. And uh, so... There were three feasts that were compulsory. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that really included an eight-day period of the, pa the Passover, the Feast of First Fruits, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They collectively called that Passover, but it's actually three of the seven feasts that are included. Then the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, which is uh, roughly f 49 plus one days later, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall. Those three feasts, Passover, collectively of those three feasts, and then uh, uh, Feast of Weeks and uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. Now this Passover is the first of four. The fourth Passover is the one where he's offered. So his, his ministry will, s it will spread over four Passovers. Don't confuse this cleansing of the temple with one that the other three synoptic Gospels, Mark, Luke, and uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, mentioned, which happened just before the last Passover. So either... John has taken the liberty of recording this up here 
for his own purposes, or there were two cleansings like that. Most scholars feel it was two, he did it twice, because he clearly did it here, and he also did it in the final one. This is Jesus' first visit as a Messiah to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changes of money. Uh, they were sitting there. And uh, there. Now, by the way, uh, they were in the outer court in the place of Gentile worship, which itself is a Jewish failure because God had intended all nations. There's, a, there's another whole aspect of this. But anyway, um, uh, in contrast to Naos, the Hiron is the, is the outer court. Naos is the temple, the sanctuary proper. Now, something else you should understand, Roman coins had the image of the emperor in contrast to Jewish coins. Coins for the temple were specific. So you might be trading in Roman coins for commerce, but they wouldn't work in, in the temple. You had to have temple coins. And that's what the money pit changed. That was a legitimate role for the money changers to be making that conversion. Okay, Because uh, the problem, they were in the wrong place. They were in a place of worship, not outside. That's the... That's why it was offensive. And so uh, the, they found in the temple those that were, uh, and so forth. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen, poured out the changers' money, overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. My father. Doesn't say our father, my father. Be very specific. It's interesting that there's only one time that Jesus didn't refer to him as my father. And that's when he hung on that cross and bellowed out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why didn't he call him father? Because he couldn't. He was in our shoes, he was in our place. And we have no capacity to grasp what really went on there. We'll be dealing with that later in the, in the uh, study of this gospel. My father's house. And uh, it's interesting, Jesus is being portrayed here as inflexibly religious and righteous. I should say inflexibly righteous. Most people have the impression that he was only meek, gentle, and compassionate. We're in for a big surprise. He is capable of anger, as we see it glimpsed here. We're going to see him in a different light. Beware the wrath of the Lamb. I preached on this once, and someone sent me some bumper stickers for my car. Beware the Lamb. I kind of like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Remember when he was up in Nazareth in Luke 4? He's in the synagogue, and he calls for the book of Isaiah, and he reads Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. And when he finishes reading, he shuts it and says, This day is that scripture fulfilled in your ears. When you compare what he read in Luke 4 with Isaiah 61, you discover he stopped at a comma. He didn't finish the sentence. The part he didn't read was, And the day of vengeance of our God. He stopped at the comma, closed, and said, This day is this scripture fulfilled. The other will be fulfilled, but that comma has lasted about 2,000 years. But when he comes back, it's going to be a very big surprise in terms of the Jesus that comes back. The day of vengeance of our God. Wow. Verse 17, the disciples remember that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And that's a quote by his disciples from Psalm 69. Psalm 69 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament for other reasons, not for this one. Another part of it th uh, that is worth your being aware of, verses 8 and 9 of that, describe his childhood days of how he and his mother were made mockery of because he was apparently illegitimate. How the drunkards made up songs about him down in the, the tavern about he and his mother. That the tension within the family among the children, they don't know who Jesus' father is. He, he, the, the stigma of illegitimacy hovers on him and his mother for over 30 years. We all know about his, we, we know, we have some glimpse of his 
pain and suffering on the cross. Most of us have no, have, have no grasp of what he put up with for 30 years as a child so that you and I could have an unblemished family tree as a son of God. Wow. Anyway, quoting Psalm 69. Moving on, verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? <laughs> Always looking for a sign. It would be interesting just to collect the different places that the Pharisees or whoever asking for a sign. And... Uh, he will have just finished something really wild, and uh, uh, they still look for a sign. And uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What's he talking about? Yeah, okay. See, this, is, this, this phrase will be misquoted during his trial when we get to the end. But, uh, and in three days, there's this three days come up again. Is there a connection of these three days and the three days of Numbers 19? They said to the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? That's the rebuttal to the strange remark, that destroy this temple and raise it in three days. See, Herod's temple actually was a massive re re restoration of Zerubbabel's temple built in the days of Nehemiah. The, the reconstruction of the temple began about 18 B.C. and was continued to about 63 A.D. If this is 46 years from the beginning, that would imply that this is all occurring about 28 A.D. If Jesus was born in 2 B.C., as we suggested a possibility of it in a previous session, um, then this would make him about 30 or priesthood age. So it all would fit together, by the way. 40 and 6 years. But of course here, the, John explains, but he spake of the temple of his body. Well, we nod in understanding that that's, we destroy this temple, meaning his body, in three days. And we all know that it's three days between the, the um, uh, crucifixion and the empty tomb. But he's equating all of this to himself, to his temple, right? I wonder what this means in comparison to the ashes of the red heifer procedure. Seven times in the scriptures, by the way, it also declares, ye are the temple of God. Here we have Jesus pointing to himself as equivalent to the temple of God, right? But you'll discover that seven times in the scripture, the same designation is given to you. We'll come to that in a minute here too. So, he spake of the temple of his body. But he answered and said unto them, well, this is back on another case, but it's another place where you're looking for a sign. He had said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. But for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Wow, that tells you that Hades is a geocentric concept, at least conceptually. And of course, he's linking Jonah and his experience to him predictively, which tells you something about Jonah most people don't know. I believe, and you can see from the text in Jonah, Jonah died. Most people don't, they assume that he was just, a, he somehow survived. He did survive it, but he went to Sheol, the term is used, and Sheol is the abode of the dead, the departed spirits. A grave and Sheol are two different things. Three days again, you know, how many times you see three days? Well, we see new life on the third day in Genesis 1. We looked at that. Abraham's offering of Isaac. When God told Abraham to offer his son, it was three days that the son was dead to him. And that's what uh, Hebrews 11:19 points that out. Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. That's why he named the place in the Mount of the Lord shall be seen. And again, 2,000 years later on that very spot, another father would offer his son. And so on. And... Uh, we always around Christmas, we always say, quote um, Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us 
a child is born, unto us a son is given. Those are not synonymous. The child is born occurred in Bethlehem. The son is given occurred on Golgotha. They're both true, but they're different aspects. Jonah the great fish, we've just looked at that one. The tola worm, and when he hangs on the cross, he says, I'm a worm and no man. The word he uses is tola. The tola is a worm that attaches itself to a tree. Its larva becomes a source of red dye. In three days it peels off white. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as wool. It's a three-day process that is alluded to, strangely enough, by the Lord on the cross. Uh, Rahab's counsel. There's a str- Rahab, there's a strange pun the Holy Spirit uses to put three days between the hebel, the trauma of the hebel, and the hope of the tikva. Three days in, in, in Rehab's council. It's another whole study. The wedding at Cana we've just been through that also had a, three, a third day emphasis both in the front end of it and in the procedure that's invoked. And of course Israel's petition for repentance as a prerequisite to the second coming in, in, in uh, Hosea. End of last verse of five and the first part of six. So three days seem to be relevant to all of this, and we've we could go through each one of these, but let's go on here. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So see, they may not have understood it when it happened, but upon reflection, John is saying they understood it later. It's basically it. No, no surprise. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name. And when they saw the miracles which he did, so it was a fruitful time apparently. And uh, this is already the the feast day. Anyway, we'll get on here. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of men for he knew what was in man. Pretty dismal close, isn't it? So, Israel's spiritual status. They had a blinded priesthood. We saw that earlier in in chapter 1. They had a joyless nation. They were without wine as the flavor here. And they had a desecrated temple, we discover. And uh, it's interesting to me that as we peel the onion on on, uh, Numbers uh, 19, that that whole procedure had to do with the temple the desecrated temple. So, the third day is emphasized as a critical aspect. It's linked with the temple, we notice that, of his body apparently. A ritual separation from death, in other words, to life, and it's not a sacrifice or an offering in itself, takes advantage of a past symbolic death, the death of the red, dealing with the ashes of a red heifer. And Jesus is, of course, our high priest. I'll let you chew on these, pray them through, and see if you feel there's any connection between the whole Kana experience and the the rest of the chapter where Jesus speaks of himself coming up on the third day. Meanwhile, though, let's get back to ourselves. Ye are the temple of God. That's declared seven times in the scripture. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, 6, 19, and 6, 16, and Ephesians 2, and Hebrews 3. Those five are by Paul. And then we have 1 Peter 2 and 1 Peter 4 by Peter himself, obviously. So Paul four times, Peter twice. But I'm always fascinated when I see the architecture by more than one. That tells me the architecture is by the Holy Spirit, not the stylistic of some particular penman. Um, so... When we get to 1 Thessalonians 5, there's an insight you need to be aware of. The very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this passage is where we get the, the insight, one of the several places, the insight of what's called the tripartite design. Uh, the spirit, the soul, and the body in that order. Spirit should be on top, leading the soul, which drives the body. We get it upside down. We let the body rule our appetites. and But anyway, that's part of the problem. We get it upside down. And so, it's interesting. There's another thing. In, only the Word of God can discern the distinction between the spirit and the soul. 
And what's my authority for that? Well, several, but Hebrews 4.12 is our authority for that. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is the reason that psychology is doomed to frustration. Because only the word of God can discern between the spirit and the soul, psyche. And so, psychology is doomed to frustration for that very reason. If you've done a study of automata in the, in the computer sciences, you know that it's impossible to discern the architecture of an infinite state machine from its external behavior. Whether you know it or not, you are an infinite state machine, mathematically speaking, and it's impossible to discern your internal architecture from your external behavior. That's a, a dictum of a, a theory of automata by John von Neumann and others. And that's exactly the dilemma that psychology faces, because they're trying to infer your architecture from your external behavior. It can't be done, because you're an infinite state machine. So as we look at this again, we looked at this in the past with the, using the, the uh, tabernacle as a model here. Uh, we can see the outer court being the body, the holy place being the soul, the self, if you will, and the, the spirit in the Holy of Holies. There's a parallelism here of body, soul, and the tripartite design of the tabernacle would seem to be an approximation, at least, of our architecture. That's why he can say seven times, ye are the temple of God. And if you say temple, you're going one step beyond this. You're going to the, the preliminary. We went through these before. The mercy seat, the ark covenant, the golden, all, all the elements of there. And uh, those were, those became the elements of the temple. And uh, so it's feasible to get into all of this from the same point of view. Set aside the furniture for the moment and take a look at the zones here. We have the body, we have the soul, and the spirit. But there's something different here. There's a couple of elements that deserve attention. And this is, this is uh, uh, amplified in the materials of uh, my wife's ministry called The Way of Agape and Be Transformed, where it really develops practical implications of this kind of architecture because it also deals with these strange wooden uh, uh, storerooms, which are the hidden chambers that seem to be uh, co-relative to what we call the subconscious those things that can affect our behavior, but they're subconscious to us if we, if we don't deal with them properly. And, uh, but the main point is there's a volitional area where you make choices that's between the soul and the body, and the, the, uh, the porch, if you will, and it has significance. This may sound strange to you, but I invite you to get acquainted with my wife's materials, um, the Way of Agape and the uh, Be Transformed materials, because they're the profoundly relevant in terms of practical guidance in these areas. Because we have the greatest commandment. Did you know we have the greatest commandment? I think we all know it, right? Because Jesus quotes the, the Shabbat from Deuteronomy 6.5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And in Matthew 22, 37, there's one place where he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy heart, soul, and with thy mind. And the question this is, is that sounds great, but how do you do that? How do you do that? That, re that will require you having some insight as to what do we mean by heart, soul, and mind. Don't think that mind means brain. They're not the same thing. Heart, soul, mind. And what do these things really mean? And my bride spent 20 years tracking down every Greek and Hebrew word that in any way related to any one of these to get their usage and discover, made all kinds of discoveries, which is what led to her family things there, heart, soul, and mind. Wow. See, we have a systems architecture. Um, you know, we, if, if I have a computer up here, obviously I've got hardware that has microcircuits and memory and those things. Um, but uh, does that tell you anything about the behavior of the computer that's here in this platform? Not at all. Because it all depends on what the soft the hardware is simply a residence for the software. The software determines what happens when I push what buttons. And there's a user interface, and there's internal interfaces, and there's a, a machine language. I won't get into all this here. The point is, is that my problem tonight is I can't see you. I can see the temporary residence that you're in. Okay? And uh, so, you know, we can, we can simulate that hardware got man, that's pretty simple, it's a switch on and off, you're either on or off. 
uh, you deal with woman, it's a little different. <laughs> and so, uh, why are you guys laughing? Huh? <laughs> You'd like a remote there too, which has, has, has some, so we can, we can play with these things, ideas. But no, the truth of the matter is, is that you have a physical body that's correlative to the hardware environment, flesh, bones, circulatory system, etc., etc., etc. But you also have the software part of you, your self, your actual self. Call it soul, spirit, mind, whatever, your thoughts themselves that makes up you, has got nothing to do with the physics of your body. That's not a physiological issue. And uh, it's the parallelism of software in the computer and the software that makes up the real you that I want to highlight here. Because there's some things we know about software that might be worth your understanding. If uh, Software has no mass. A light switch that's on or off can be storing a one or a zero, but it doesn't change the mass of it, does it? It weighs the same whether it's on or off, right? Um, software has no mass. If I take a little diskette, now we're using different things, but you remember the little diskettes, I'll just use that as my example here, and I weigh a blank cassette, it weighs about seven tenths of an ounce. If I load that cassette with a million bytes of software and weigh it, it'll weigh seven tenths of an ounce. Didn't change the mass. I can even send software through the airwaves, can I? And software has no mass. And so, I can go through that. See, the real you is, is software, not hardware. And uh, it's self-modifying, history-dependent, and space-transcendent. But that's you. Now, it has no mass. You need to understand that. If, you've, if, we, if we had a background on the use of time and all that, you know that, that time has, it varies by mass, acceleration, and gravity. If you're outside, if you have no mass, you have no time. Software has no t mass. So it's not restricted to a time domain. That means you are eternal whether you're saved or not. You're still software whether you're saved or not. The dilemma is where are you going to spend it? That's what it's all about. Eternity is a long time. And that's what we're going to deal with in depth in chapter 3 of the Gospel of John. So uh, we'll that will be in our next session. We've been through wedding at Cana and the cleansing of the temple. We have the water purification sort of tucked behind the scenes of the wedding of Cana. We have the tripart residency highlighted by Lord himself in chapter 2. And it's up to you to reflect to see are there connections that have not really been made in our literature between the two halves of this chapter. And uh, we've had some topical tutorials here. We obviously went through the ash red heifer and the background of the water purification. And we talked about personal architecture in terms of Jesus saying, destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And so for our next session, I want you to prepare by studying John chapter 3. It's a very rich chapter. Um, it's in that spirit then. You might also read Numbers 21, the familiar tale about the brass serpent, the brazen serpent. And uh, there's aspects that that may surprise you. Where, where is this strange remedy that God has Moses use in Numbers 21? Where is it explained anywhere else in the Bible? It's a weird deal. Where is it explained? And uh, how is this event in Numbers 21 significant apologetically? Now the word apologetic may be a new term to you comes from the Greek word apologia, which means speaking in defense. It's the discipline of defending a position through systematic use of reason. In 2 Peter 3.15, be ready always to give every man an answer of the hope that is within you. That's a call. You're not going to win anybody through apologetics. Because it's, it's not a logical issue. It's not an illogical issue either, but the point is you are called to be able to defend your position rationally. And that's what apologetics is. We don't spend a lot of time on that because I'm not sure it bears fruit usually, but we shouldn't be inconsistent with that. So the question is, what do we learn from Numbers 21 that's going to be exemplified in chapter 3 um, 
that's useful to us apologetically. That's your challenge for next time. And so uh, apologetics is a practical tool, but it's uh, not an end in itself. So with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for the mysteries that lie behind these metaphors. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate the text that we might understand precisely what it is that you would have of us in these days, that we might be more effective for you as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation whatsoever. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our kinsman redeemer, our coming king.